Good morning, everyone. I'm Veronica Horn, president of the Saginaw County Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much, and we're, we're thrilled that you could uh, join us this morning for Focal Point. The topic today is what a trillion dollar infrastructure plan means for mid-Michigan, the first event in the Chamber's Public Policy Bite series. Before we get started, I wanna share just a few logistical um, items for today's program. We're, we will be muting everyone except for the presenter to avoid echoing, phone ringing, and conversations with uh, four-legged co-workers. We will have a question and answer at the end of today's presentation, so we ask that you type any questions in the chat feature. We'll monitor your questions and try to answer them at the end. And finally, we recommend that you view this uh, in speaker mode to enhance your viewing pleasure. And now to begin our program, as always, I'd like to invite all of you to join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to extend my thanks and appreciation to any and all elected officials and public servants who've joined us today, as well as all of the sponsors for this event. Our sponsors are vitally important in helping us provide programming and connection opportunities like this. Their generosity helps us share important information about the things happening locally and outside the county that impact the way we do business. So our thanks go out this morning to premier sponsors, AT&T, Dow, and Saginaw Valley State University, as well as to gold sponsors, Consumers Energy, Next Tier Automotive, and Saginaw Future Inc. We truly appreciate your leadership. One of the priorities of the Saginaw County Chamber of Commerce is to actively educate and advocate issues important to the business community on behalf of our members. That's one of the reasons we're offering this program today. So I'd like to share a little bit about the Chamber's advocacy efforts over the last several months. We have been working closely with Saginaw Future to identify community projects for three sources of funding through the federal government. First and high priority is funding for specific projects that fall within a congressional districts. We're working with both Congressman Dan Kildee and Congressman John Molinar to identify community development projects that we might advocate for. Second is funding coming through the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. This is the recently passed legislation to provide dollars to municipalities, townships, and counties. And the third is the anticipated infrastructure bill. You'll hear much more about this from today's presenter. We also continue to advocate for keeping the Line 5 pipeline open and the Great Lakes Tunnel moving forward. That project was approved by Lansing in 2018 with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy early this year. The April Chamber blog on our website provides background information and links on this issue and why we support it. The Chamber has been a very active supporter of the Reopen Michigan Coalition, which advocates that businesses be allowed to bring back employees or not bring back employees based on their individual ability to follow COVID-19 health guidelines. More locally, we are supporting a federal funding request from STARS, Saginaw Transit Authority Regional Services, to replace five full-size transit bus buses and to sustain and expand transportation services in Saginaw County. Related to STARS, we also sent support letters on behalf of Saginaw Valley State University to develop a midtown transit gateway, allowing easier access for employees and students from throughout the Great Lakes Bay region. It's important to the chamber, the business community and area residents to support projects, funding requests, millage proposals and other legislative efforts that will benefit all of Saginaw County as well as the region and the state of Michigan. We know that it's difficult for a single voice to stay on top and catch the attention of our policymakers, 
that's why the chamber advocacy is one of our top priorities. Our role as your chamber is to provide accurate information on the issues and then take the collective voices of our community and point them at policymakers with a volume to break through the rest of the noise. It's our job to make them hear us. This morning's program is part of that process. And so with that, I'd like to introduce this morning's featured speaker. John Kramer took the reins in January as president of architecture, engineering and planning firm OHM Advisors, which has mid-Michigan offices in Saginaw, Mount Pleasant and Midland. A professional engineer with nearly 30 years of experience as a municipal advisor, John began his career with OHM in 1993 as an intern in the Municipal Engineering Group. Over the next two decades, he served as a project engineer, shareholder, vice president, and served as the firm's first ever chief operating officer. John is extremely engaged in advocacy efforts at both the local and national level lobbying legislators in DC for more than a decade. I'm sorry, John. As part of ACEC Advocacy Day, he has forged partnerships in community and industry organizations and has been actively involved with the APWA, ACEC, the South Oakland County Municipal Engineers and the Michigan Society of Professional Engineers. It's my pleasure to introduce and please welcome John Kramer. Well, thank you, Veronica. Very, uh, very warm introduction. And I wanna thank Nancy, Veronica and Lisa uh, from the chamber for having me. Uh, bear with me while I'm, I'm pulling up my, uh, my screen here. Uh, I do have some good news for you. I, I'm not gonna talk. I know we all have a little bit of uh, Zoom fatigue, but I'm not gonna talk for uh, an hour on you here, probably be closer to a, a half hour. Um, can everyone see the screen okay? All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, what a trillion dollar infrastructure plan means for mid-Michigan. Uh, I would have liked to be in person with you all. Um, I think we all wanna get back a little bit more in person. I will admit that I was okay not, not driving two hours to meet with you in person, but this is, this is a pretty big deal. And I think one of the first things that I wanna talk about, you know, Congress is in the midst of making a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure investment. And I wanna talk about how much $2 trillion really actually is. And I know a lot of you have probably at some point in your life uh, held a $100 bill in your hand. And I wanted to talk this $2 trillion in terms of $100 bills. If you stack the $100 bills right on top of each other, it's about three and a half feet tall, the height of a chair. So the good news for us is if you go back to all the movies you used to watch maybe as a kid, you can actually fit a million dollars in a briefcase just like they showed you in those movies. And uh, if, if you have a sport coat, you might even be able to fit a million dollars if you stuffed every pocket. But let's look at that as far as what a billion dollars is. If you do the math, a billion dollars actually comes to about two thirds of a mile, 3,500 feet, taller than the world's tallest building, uh, Burj Khalifa over there in uh, Dubai, I think it is. So that starts to put a little perspective as to what a billion dollars is. Now let's talk about the trillion dollars or two trillion dollars, if you will. That gets to over 1,356 miles tall, uh, International Space Station, 248 miles. So we're talking five times as tall as the International Space Station. Just in case we have any, any engineers that are on the line, the height of the chair at 3.5 feet, it's actually 3.58 feet and that little eight hundredths of a foot, if you do the math out, could actually change that $2 trillion by 20 miles or so. But we're talking about a lot of money and that can be both good as bad as you see it debated uh, out there. Now the money is gonna come in two packages and I'm, I'm, I wanted to go over this just a little bit for clarification. We have the American Rescue Plan Act, which is the $1.9 trillion COVID recovery stimulus bill, which was passed uh, back in March. The one we're gonna spend a lot of time on today is the American Jobs Plan Act, which is the two and a quarter trillion dollar infrastructure investment bill, uh, which has been proposed and your CN discussions have begun. I did wanna briefly talk about what that American Rescue Plan Act, just to sort of help you see some of the differences. The main goals of that 
uh, was the National Vaccine Program, uh, looking at COVID-19. We've seen a lot of our schools reopening, making sure that we're doing that safe, uh, delivering immediate relief to struggling families and workers, struggling communities. So uh, those of you, maybe yourself or maybe your friends or family, have got some of these $1,400 relief payments. That was all part of what already passed. Now there was some in there, uh, state and local fiscal recovery, which was $350 billion for public health and economic response, as well as, now I call it minor, $10 billion of capital project funds uh, to help rural America uh, with uh, internet access, et cetera. Uh, that, I don't think that's uh, hit everyone yet. Uh, that will be coming out to those state and local communities, uh, but that is coming. Uh, the, there's kind of wide spending discretion with very few restrictions. And again, this could be viewed as both good or bad. Sometimes when you're trying to get the money out, uh, it, it's, it's harder to put the restrictions on it. Uh, but nonetheless, that will be coming and the payments are allocated according to some formulas on employment numbers, population, et cetera. It's some fancy calculus to know exactly how it is, but I think you could start looking at uh, what did the city of Saginaw get, say, versus the city of Livonia or the city of Auburn Hills? I think some of that data is out there. Now, the American Jobs Plan Act, so this is the $2.25 trillion. This is the most ambitious investment since the New Deal, and it's for building the nation's transportation network, winning the space race. And when I say the New Deal, this might have been a little bit before my time. We're talking FDR in the 1930s. And some of the projects that were built as part of that would include like the Hoover Dam. Uh, those of you that have been to San Antonio, the San Antonio Riverwalk, or maybe uh, New York City, the, the Lincoln Tunnel. So these are projects built 80 years ago that are still in place today. And, and frankly, a lot of people go and see these uh, or use them on a daily basis. And as you can imagine, conversations have really just begun about how much and how it will be paid for the goal is to pass it by July 4th per the speaker. Uh, that may flex. And I will admit, as even as recent as last night, uh, all kinds of news breaking about a, a proposed repan, uh, plan from the Republicans. And, and I'll talk briefly on that, but my slides uh, weren't able to keep up with it. I'm going to try today, though, to stay out of the, the red and the blue and the politics. Uh, so, for instance, uh, how it will be paid for, that's one of the discussions that will be out there. Uh, obviously, there, there's talk of uh, changing corporate taxes, which today is at 21%. It used to be at 35%. Uh, it's proposed to come in at 28% on corporate taxes. And some of the negotiations, maybe that'll end up at 25%. That's one of the big sticking points is how to pay for it. In addition, uh, if you were paying attention to the news last night, uh, for those of you, I know we got a lot of you on the line that make over a million dollars a year. Uh, they're looking at the capital gains tax and the capital gains tax, which today might be at 20%. They're talking about pushing that if you make over a million dollars uh, to the uh, current taxable rate, which might be the, the 37%. Uh, in addition, you've heard that the, the top tax rate at the 37% could get bumped back up to that 39.4%. So these are all things we'll pay attention to. I'm not claiming it's good or bad, but I'm letting you know that's where the, the arguments are and, and will be for the next several months for sure. The main goal though of the American Jobs Plan Act, and it's kind of right there in the title, it's to create jobs. So rebuilding the country's infrastructure uh, with an eye toward the future for resiliency, uh, withstanding climate and economic crisis, and to help position us to uh, outcompete China. And what we're seeing with our infrastructure is we are continuing to drop in world status. Uh, that's not gonna be good moving forward. So the American Jobs Plan Act, high points of the plan related to physical infrastructure is $621 billion for transportation. Now that includes bridges, highways, and roads. I think 85 billion of that's for transit, 80 billion for Amtrak. We've got airport improvements, ports, and inland waterways. Uh, and then 100 billion for water and wastewater grants and loans, which is critical. Uh, you're gonna hear a lot of discussion about broadband when we sent the nation home uh, last March and April, uh, you know, holding a Zoom meeting with someone that's on a dial up uh, doesn't work so well. So that is pretty critical uh, from a corporate and business perspective, as well as to individuals, as well as uh, people that are, we're trying to do school, uh, getting our broadband deployment up uh, is gonna be a good thing. 
And then $100 billion to build a more resilient electric power grid. Uh, we just have to look back at what happened in Texas. Uh, we know that our, our power grid could, could use some upgrades. And then $100 billion for uh, public school buildings, $213 billion for affordable housing. Now, again, back to that whole quick math. If you add all this up, you're somewhere around a trillion of what I've showed you. And the last bullet point, again, and this is what I call uh, where some of the points of contention are going to be the next several months, is there's another trillion in there. Um, and, and the term that's being used is social infrastructure. And I've seen that second trillion broken down into, well, 400 billion of it is really pure social stuff, and 600 billion of it is kind of hybrid social infrastructure. Uh, but we're talking uh, housing uh, inequities and transportation and affordable housing. Um, removing blight. So again, I'm not going to say this is good or bad, but when you get to the, the, the two sides uh, fighting over this, this is very clearly uh, where a lot of that energy is focused. And if you watched last night, so the, the Biden administration's bills, the 2.25 trillion, which includes all of this, the Republicans came out with, I want to say it was about 550 billion, and it's really just transportation. So just kind of these top couple lines here. And when you look at that, that's 25% of what's being proposed. Uh, I, I, I really wanna see something passed and my guess is it'll be somewhere in the middle, uh, but starting at 25% versus the full thing, is that a negotiation tactic? Is that a non-starter? Uh, time will play out, but these are, these are the fun things that uh, we can pay attention to over the next several months. So that's a lot of money and it's expensive, uh, but the conversations have have begun. This might be a little optimistic. It says some kind of bill is going to be passed uh, for the long needed federal infrastructure. Uh, we're ranked number 13th in the world as far as our infrastructure. Uh, ASC every, every year, a couple of years, puts out the grades. They rate our infrastructure. And the US's current grade for infrastructure, D plus, right? Uh, Michigan's grade, yay, we're right there, we're average, we're, we're D plus, and you can see it broken down with roads and drinking water. And I don't know about you, but if, if these were my kids coming home from school with these grades, I don't think it would be, uh, it, it would not be good. But the reality is, and, and I know I am one of these engineers, we're not out there trying to play politics with this. This is the status of your infrastructure. We just want to present the data there. Um, despite that bill's final price tag today, 2.25 trillion, maybe it, maybe it comes down to 1 trillion, we'll see. Uh, something that I view as a, as a good positive is it's proven that infrastructure and investment creates jobs and helps lift the economy. So I think that's a, a very important note. So for example, one in 33 jobs in the US is tied to the engineering sector. Every dollar spent on engineering services in the US uh, increases the GDP by $1.55. And infrastructure work, it creates those short-term engineering related jobs. And then there's the trickle down jobs that follow. And then obviously we're talking contractors and everything, uh, but the investment in our infrastructure, it's gonna increase the need for those engineering services, related jobs, increase the GDP. And then the beauty as far as I'm concerned is the final result leaves something behind. It's not like you spend the money and then it's gone. If you're putting a bridge over a river, you're going to use that bridge for the next 50 years. Uh, if you're putting an interchange on an interstate highway, you watch what happens the next five years. If you add an interchange, you're going to see a hotel pop up at that interchange. You're going to see a gas station. You're going to see medical office. You're going to see things that help drive your local uh, community. And these are good things. Again, once you spend that money, you create all those jobs to design it. You create all those jobs to build it. But then the aftermath is something's there to be used by the people in perpetuity. And you're gonna have a structure. I mentioned earlier that Hoover Dam or the San Antonio Riverwalk. It's not like people don't still today fly out to Las Vegas to go see the Hoover Dam or down to San Antonio to go have some nice Italian food and, and walk the Riverwalk. So these are, these are good things in my mind. So the money is coming, we, we hope when and how much still to be determined. One very important thing is how should you prioritize it? How should you spend it? And this, you know, this is my bread and butter, of course, so I love these kind of questions. But first you wanna look at your needs and your wants. So road work through Michigan, we know it's pretty bad. Governor obviously ran on that platform. Uh, we've got aging infrastructure vulnerable to climate threats, 
Flint, Michigan. We don't need to talk about the water issues we've had there. We talked about Texas energy grid failure. We got hurricanes. Don't want to talk about dam failures. I know that that hits close to home and the flooding, but these are all things that are there. And one thing that we've learned uh, is our infrastructure system is very fragile. The slightest thing can set something off. Uh, we've got broadband uh, that we know we need to expand the lead and the drinking water. Good news is Michigan's at the forefront because of some state regulations. Bad news is how we got there. Uh, but the EPA is going to be pushing that, and there's going to be a lot of other states that, that need to, to catch up with where we're at and trying to fix that. I think Veronica mentioned in the beginning, uh, Saginaw County Chamber has been communicating with your elected officials as far as some ideas of, of things that the chamber would want. So in Bay County, you're looking at broadband housing redevelopment needs, downtown Saginaw, substantial infrastructure needs along the riverfront to develop that untapped potential for manufacturing, medical business. And I think this is key. Looking at those types of things, uh, this is very important. Uh, Midland, we know we have dams and road and broadband infrastructure that we want to fix. And then the regional transit connector. These are great things. If you don't have a list, when that money comes, you're not gonna be able to capitalize on it. Uh, earlier this week, uh, my office had some conversations with the Saginaw County Road Commission, and, and they also have a list of things. They talked about they wanna reconstruct Dixie Highway into Bridgeport, which is kind of that gateway to Frankenmuth. Again, this is a great thing because you reconstruct that, a gateway to an area where you got tourists and, and commerce and people that wanna spend money. These are good things. Uh, they want to install a roundabout at Titawabasi and River Roads. This is a good thing, and we can talk about how roundabouts, these are good. I know not all of us love them, uh, but when you talk, want to talk about that resiliency and look into the future, what happens when you have power outages? Your traffic lights don't work, and now you're sending two police officers to direct traffic. Roundabouts work through that. What happens with roundabouts? Are you paying electricity for 365 days a year to run that roundabout? No. So there are some uh, resilient aspects of that. And then they mentioned 30% of all bridges in Saginaw County are at reduced load rated and in poor condition. And I apologize, I, I wanted to squeeze all these local needs on this slide. That's not really a want in my mind, that's a need. You've got your bridges in bad shape. Over 100 bridges are needed in a repair in Saginaw County. Guess how many you have money to fix every year? Five or six. So you could fix five or six bridges a year, but you have 100 of them in need of major repair. So again, planning for potential infrastructure stimulus uh, is something you wanna do. And it sounds like a lot of your organizations are working on that. So you wanna fix what's broken to the extent possible, but you also want to plan for the future. And you really wanna look at smart strategies to enhance your resilience, sustainability, and reliability for all of your infrastructure systems. And when we talk about fixing what's broken, you know, prioritizing is key. So I've listed some general steps here, and this is what I would call asset management 101. A lot of you have probably heard the terminology of an asset management plan, and this is key. Anytime there's federal funding that, that comes, uh, you want to be ready for that. And I want you to think, you know, in your various communities, you have a lot of different assets. So it could be facilities. You might have buildings. So the city of Saginaw, I have no idea, but maybe they actually own 30 municipal buildings, right? They could have a city hall, a DPW, fire stations, police stations. So you wanna look at all of your facilities. You may have parks and recreation, right? You may have parks that are well utilized, parks that aren't well utilized. You wanna know where they are, how well utilized they are. Non-motorized facilities, bike assessments, right? I've been to Saginaw and I don't know if they call them the power line trails. I, I've been running on those when my kids have uh, soccer games up in Saginaw. These are great assets to the community. Uh, these are things you wanna look at. Are they in good shape? Do you need more? Are there key connectors that are gonna really help the community thrive? The obvious is the roadways, which goes beyond just the roadways. You've got signs, you've got street lights, you've got streetscapes. And then don't forget the ones underground. I know the, the engineers on the line, they know all about this, but out of sight, out of mind, uh, your drinking water, your sanitary sewer systems and your storm systems, these are very important things. And generally, we, no one looks at them until they do break and then it costs 10 times as much to fix them. Next step is doing an assessment. What condition is it in? Is it reliable? Looking at that utilization, do you need it? 
what value does it provide? Back to some of those city buildings I talked about, if you have these 30 buildings, maybe five of them really don't get used at all and it doesn't provide a lot of value and maybe five of them are getting used a lot. It's important to know these things so that you can prioritize. And then forecasting, giving the, the funding, what is the asset's future state? Will it serve the needs? And then plan, 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 you know, budgeting, capital planning, uh, the O&M, operations and maintenance planning, depreciation. Uh, a lot of us, you know, when we take care of our cars, we know if we change the oil every three months or whatever it is, we might have a car that we're going to get two or 300,000 miles on that engine. But if you don't change the oil, which is relatively cheap, right, maybe it's $20 for a cheap oil change, $100 for an expensive oil change. Uh, it costs a lot more to get a new car or replace that engine. The same is true for your roads. The same is true for your underground infrastructure. If you have a sanitary sewer dig up, it might cost you a million dollars if you have a big one to fix it. Well, you could have fixed that whole line two miles long rather than just 30 feet where you had the blowout that takes the intersection out if you take care of it all along. So these, these are important things to look at. Creating a long-term sustainable funding source that allows the creation of, again, this five to 10 year asset management plan, which will help you uh, formulate your capital improvement plan so you can leverage and maximize the impacts of the funds. This, this is what's key. Um, some advice here is on your infrastructure investment, you're gonna now have an opportunity, assuming we see some kind of a stimulus bill passed for a paradigm shift. And you wanna make sure that you are being strategic so you can really start being more proactive versus responsive. Don't fault your local leaders right now. They don't have the money to fix this stuff. We just mentioned the Saginaw County Road Commission. You got a hundred bridges that are in bad shape and you've got money to fix five every year you're never gonna catch up. So it's not their fault they don't have the money, but if you do get that money, you wanna make sure that you're tackling those in the right order, doing the right fixes. Other advice I have, don't start what you don't wanna finish. You don't wanna kinda of, kind of, sorta of get involved in an asset management plan, then let it sit on the shelf and do nothing for five years, because if you're not keeping that updated, it's pretty worthless and now you're back to where you were. And then let value decisions drive your process not data collection. I'm going to go back to that uh, city of Saginaw. And again, I have no idea how many buildings they have, but assuming they have 30 buildings, if five of those are never used, and we're saying go out and inventory those buildings, maybe you don't need to get on your knees and hands and crawl through those five buildings that are never used with a flashlight and spend hours and, and dollars detailing those because you know that maybe those just need to be torn down and not replaced versus those buildings that are used every day and have all kinds of people and maybe have some pedestrian traffic issues and how it's laid out, that's where you gotta to wanna to spend more of your time on your inventory. Um, you, you don't wanna waste your dollars on that data collection. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense. If you know that you have an 80 year old municipal building that is totally dilapidated and out of date, again, why are you gonna spend your, your, your money and time trying to figure out how bad out of date is if you know it's gonna to be torn down. Save your money there and put it elsewhere. Fix it before you replace it. I already gave you the, the car analogy there, but again, with your roads, crack sealing those roads and, 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 and doing some minor repairs to them. If you have a mile of road, and this always changes, but it can cost a million dollars a mile to replace a road, but it might only cost $50,000 every few years to do some minor stuff to them. And now you increase the life of that road for 10 or 20 years. That's a way better way to go versus trying to replace something in full every time it's gone past its useful life. So again, after you do this inventorying, you wanna to look towards the future. Consider whether the design and the materials are resilient and sustainable. I talked a little bit earlier about that traffic roundabout. Uh, is it a better fix for a signalized intersection because it won't break down a power failure? Usually with a roundabout, it's all about the real estate and how much room you have. Uh, there's a lot of advantages to those. The dam designs, we know uh, that we've had dam failures. We know that a lot of our dams are in bad shape. Uh, we also know that there's probably gonna be increased flooding in the future. We've seen it up in the UP, we've seen it in mid Michigan. We've had plenty of different floods that show us that these 100 year and 500 year floods don't occur every 100 year or 500 years anymore. They happen every five or eight years or whatever it is. That I can tell you is happening all across the country. So what are we gonna do about it? How can we look to the future for that? Same thing with pavement, uh, pavement repair. 
right now, every local municipality, they know, you know, they do a fix on a road and it only lasts seven years and it falls apart. And then the, the citizens get mad and they say, well, why, why are you doing that cheap fix? Well, remember, that's all they have. Well, if you have a little more stimulus money, maybe you can look at more resilient fixes because you actually have the, the money to look at it in a, in a better, better way. Other innovative strategies is leveraging private investment. This is what we like to, to call the one plus one equals three. It's not bad math, it's actually a good thing. Stakes are high, money is gonna move fast and be deployed smartly. But what you wanna be able to do is 10 years from now, you wanna be able to look back and, and say, well, which places just spent their money and which places invested it? And you wanna be that community that invests your money. So. Yes, you can get that money and pave two blocks of road or fix a water valve that's broken, and you do need to do that. But if that's all you're looking at, then you're just gonna fix some broken things and you're gonna raise your, your, your D plus grade with a whole lot of money. Maybe it comes up to a C plus or, or, or a B minus, and, and that would be great. But you wanna really look to the future and think innovatively, is there an area in your community that needs revitalization? Uh, is it underperforming and not generating revenue for your community? Uh, you want to invest those funds into infrastructure, land acquisition that complement other private sector investments to help get the project done. We did a job in the city of Southfield, uh, what's called the Northland Mall. And for those of you who don't know it, I think it's one of the oldest malls in the whole country. I don't remember if it was built in the 50s or whatever it is. A lot of times we're just waiting for some developer to come in and develop it. Uh, you've, you've heard of the term PPP, and I'm not talking about the, the loan system for COVID. I'm talking about public-private investment. This is something that I would definitely encourage. Sometimes it's, it's looked at specific to infrastructure, but it can also be looked at to development. So back to your riverfront. If you're just sitting back and waiting for a developer to come in and develop on the riverfront, it may never happen. But if you can get the public involved to figure out what do people want downtown, and then if the municipalities can look at what could we build, what do developers want? Is there something that a city can do? And then because the city does that, then the developer says, now I wanna do something, you come together and it gets complicated with agreements, but more things are possible if we bring people to the table. If you go back to again, the 1950s, Eisenhower came up with the interstate system. This was a great thing for our country, did a lot of great stuff. And then you saw crazy development in the 60s and the 70s where developers were just building everywhere, right? They were building the infrastructure. They were paving the roads, putting in the water and the sewer. Now the problem we have is, A, no one can afford to just go out and build all that stuff. Infrastructure costs are just simply too expensive. And we have the deterioration and the horrible costs and the horrible infrastructure that's in the ground that no one could afford to fix. So it's not going to continue the way it happened in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. We need a different way, which is part of why you're seeing this infrastructure stimulus bill, and which is part of why I'm recommending that you look at different ways such as public-private partnerships. You really want to understand your community's vision. So not all communities are created equal, right? I mean, we, we talked about the Hoover Dam and they got Las Vegas. And if you go to Colorado, you have mountains and the ocean communities have oceans. So every community is going to have to figure out what do they have, what do their people want, but what does your community want to be known for? What's that untapped potential and what infrastructure investments are going to make that lasting impact? Again, it goes beyond paving these two blocks of road and fixing the water valve. It's back to that. You talked about wanting to do something on the riverfront. What can you do to the riverfront to bring people in, to bring commerce in, paving that Dixie Highway? If that helps the whole Frankenmuth thing and people are coming to shop and people are staying at hotels and spending money, that's probably good for your community. So you wanna look at infrastructure changes that are gonna help you with those types of things. So I would encourage you to actively engage your community. Uh, you know, Looking at effective funding allocation requires the understanding of the residents and the members and the broad immediate needs. So you really need to get that, that community engagement uh, and, and put together your community engagement plan so you can figure out what are those needs, get the buy-in on the medium and the long-term growth funding strategies and get a better measure on the impact of your spending decisions. You wanna make sure that you're developing projects with tangible quantifiable benefits. So the direct impact of the infrastructure project, but the indirect effects 
on the economy and society after that. So economic growth from construction, we talked about those multiplier effects it has, right? When you build that interchange, you create all those jobs to design it, you create all those jobs to build it, but then the hotel comes, the medical office comes, the gas station comes, et cetera, et cetera. These are good things for increased economic activity. It's gonna increase the tax revenue. It's also gonna help expand the area talent pool, uh, downtown Saginaw, again, the riverfront, uh, attract private investment for manufacturing and medical, create those jobs. And uh, you know, along the riverfront, you might bring arts and entertainment along with new visitor traffic if you, if you do some of these things. So recap, federal infrastructure funding, it's coming soon. It's gonna go fast. You need to assess your community's needs and wants. You wanna fix what's broken to the extent possible based on the funding, but plan for the future. Keep looking out and apply those smart strategies to enhance resilience, sustainability, and reliability for infrastructure systems. That concludes the, the formal part of my presentation. I, I promised I'd be closer to a half hour than that, that full hour. And Veronica, I think what we said is I am happy to answer uh, Q&A and people can put them in the chat room and uh, we can always change up on that if that works. And I can uh, stop sharing my screen here. Well, thank you, John. Um, I don't see any questions, but there are a few things that I do wanna to touch on for those of you viewing. Um, we are well ahead of the game. So this is, this is the great news. Saginaw Future, uh, the city of Saginaw, the county of Saginaw, the chamber, we have all been at the table already looking at, at these things that we need to do to be prepared. We have been doing that for a few years now. We've already done a SWOT analysis of our South Washington area that most of you know that has been a long-term undertaking. You've seen the development along South Washington. That's just the beginning. Um, we have uh, worked together with Saginaw Future. We've done more than a SWOT analysis. Now we know that medical is really critical to the success of the entire region. And so we've had our asks together waiting for something like this. And this is, I want you to know that this presentation is, is here without prejudice. I, we don't wanna talk about whether or not we agree with the funding you know, coming from Washington. We just know it's here and it's coming. So we need to, if we're gonna, if we're gonna utilize this money, we wanna do it in the best way so that this region becomes sustainable for the long-term. And as John pointed out, it's, in, it's infrastructure and, and really getting ready for that economic development. We have private partnerships working with us to help develop these areas. So our asks are in. In the beginning of the presentation, I mentioned a few things we were working on, but our highest priority is infrastructure money along the riverfront of Saginaw, Saginaw County, Saginaw City. We are all working together on that. We have leadership in place in this region that has been very supportive of the efforts. Um, a couple of other things I wanna to touch on. Our one of our top priorities, again, is broadband. We have that in common with Bay, Midland, Saginaw counties. We have got to deliver state-of-the-art uh, infrastructure in, in broadband and communication. Um, the Dixie Highway was, spe was specifically pointed out. We've already, um, well, Saginaw Future, the, and thank you, Saginaw County Road Commission, Senator Ken Horn, who saw the wisdom in really improving a highway that was so old, it was dangerous to drive on. So this is the second phase and it will go from about, you know, almost I-75 to the to Junction Road. Again, improving and widening that road. Um, Saginaw County and SFI and the city are really working together on a strategic plan of how to invest that money you know, and we have been working closely with our legislators for quite a while, pointing these needs out so they're well aware. We have great relationships with our federal, state, and local um, government, city governments, and, and so we are working hand in hand. That's the great news. We're ahead of the game because we already have a strategic plan. But I want to I wanna thank John again. Oh, from Facebook, are you thinking ahead with COVID thinking? If we end up in a pandemic, we need to be ready. 
Um, we certainly are. Uh, you know, all of our organizations are working closely with the health department, with the state of Michigan. We know that eventually another pandemic is going to come, not necessarily COVID. It, it, there, it, and, and so we have to be better prepared with PPE, with, with human infrastructure. Our, our first responders are warned from this current pandemic. So we have to attract talent. Some of the things that we're doing, you see Saginaw Valley State University has now located a, a, a center in downtown Saginaw. And we have Delta College downtown. We need to do, home grow our, our talent, get them the opportunities in school and keep them in the region. So to help address those kinds of things, unknown things that will come along. So yes, thank you for that question. Um, but we do appreciate all of the expertise and information. Okay, wait a minute, I have another question here. I recently heard Saginaw schools are building a, an athletic complex along the river. Sounds great. Can you discuss detail, location, and schedule? No, I can't, Steve. But we are going to have Dr. Ramont Roberts at an upcoming PERC, I believe in September, to lay that whole, the whole thing out. We were supportive of a new high school, which will be built in the spot that um, SASA is located, which is essentially on the riverfront, on the west side of the river. It's gonna be a state-of-the-art complex and he will give us those details. So thank you for asking that, but uh, we have been supportive of that. We had two high schools that one had like 600 students, one had 400 students, very overly old buildings. And now we're gonna have one that'll right size and it will be a state-of-the-art facility to give all of our kids a great opportunity at, at a public education. So, with that, again, John, we're grateful for your expertise and the information that you provided with this, uh, with what this infrastructure plan could mean for this region. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, now, though, to wrap things up, I'd like to thank all of today's sponsors. Again, AT&T, thank you. Dow, thank you. Saginaw Valley State University, Consumers Energy, Next Tier Automotive, and certainly Saginaw Future Incorporated. Before we go, I want to remind you that the Chamber will hold our next virtual perk breakfast on Thursday, May 6th for an update on the Thrive Initiative, which is very critical to our efforts to make this a healthy region. The Chamber will continue to communicate current information that impacts local business through our website, www.saginawchamber.org, our newsletter at a glance, and Chamber update emails. We wanna thank you for participating in today's Focal Point legislative event and hope you'll join us at our next event. Remember to shop with fellow chamber members whenever possible. And with that, there are very few clouds in the sky and I say, enjoy the rest of your day. Take the rest of the day off and have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. Thanks everyone.